take I breathe in you Every step I take I take in you You are my way, Jesus Every breath I breathe I breathe in you Waves of mercy Waves of grace I see I breathe, I breathe in you Every step I take, I take in you You're the only way, Jesus Every breath I breathe, I breathe in you There's a mercy
You are God of every circumstance You are God when we fall and God when we stand And you are God, you hold us in your hand Yes, you do
Yes, Lord. Woo! It leads us into worship. This is uh, totally different from the way we normally have a Friday night service. But um, I want everyone just, to, just for a minute to sit down, find a seat and sit down. Everyone in the chapel, I want you to sit down. Team, you can sit down also. <clears throat> what a powerful night this has already been. I'm just, it's awesome. I want everyone to find their seat, and I want you to listen carefully. This is not planned. This is something that I just, I, the Lord laid on my heart just a minute ago. We're going to take up an offering tonight. I want you to hear me. I don't want you to get out your checkbook or anything. I want you to hear me. This offering on Friday nights, for those of you that are visiting from other countries, translators, I want you to make sure our foreign visitors understand this. This is the only offering our ministry receives in the whole revival. Ushers, we need someone to take care of that back there. I want quiet. This is the only offering this ministry receives in the revival. All the other ones out of our request, Wednesday, which is some of Brownsville comes on Wednesday night. Wednesday night goes to the church. Thursday night goes to the church. Saturday night goes to the church. And, of course, Sunday morning. I told the pastor early on in the revival that I wanted one offering. Now, many of you know that most evangelists, when they come in, they could have all the offerings of the revival service. Pastors, you know that. That's how it usually works outside of the Wednesday and the Sundays. That's just par for the course. I want you to hear me. Listen. But we chose, because this revival has never been about money. I want you to hear me. Never has been about money. It's about souls. I want you to understand that. Because the people on this platform could be ahead of time. Ken Landers and New Hope Home. And the rescue mission, Lord, we bless the waterfront rescue mission. We bless this home. We bless this work. And God... Every dollar needs to come in tonight. And you know what, Lord? We want to give this. We want to give it freely. Lord, our ministry needs help. This ministry needs help. This is the work of the Lord. Use this congregation tonight. We want to see a miracle offering, Jesus. A miracle offering in your precious name. Amen. God bless you. Take just a minute to write out your checks. After this, we're going to worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. It's going to be easy to worship the Lord if you have given what the Lord has spoken to your heart about. Now, those of you that are visiting for the first time, we never do this in the revival. If you think we do, you're wrong. I've been here three and a half years. This is rare. As a matter of fact, last week, I think I spent two minutes on the offering, and we just took it up. Just took up the offering. Didn't I, ushers? We just took it up just like that. Tonight, it's different. Everybody ready? Amen. Give what God has told you to give.
Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless your name, bless your name, Lord. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. You ascended to heaven and nevermore will reign. At the end of the age, when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. For with wisdom and mercy and justice, you reign at your Father's side. And the angels will cry. There's a sword in our hand, a sword at our side. There's a fire in our spirit that cannot be denied. As the Father has told us, for these you have died. For the nations that gather before you. And the ears of all men need to hear of the Lamb who was crucified. Who descended to hell yet was raised up to reign. And your Father... Bless you, Jesus. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across this land. And he's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say yes, we'll ride with you. He has fire in his eye and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across his land. He's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? And we say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We'll ride with you. Sing with me, everybody. We say yes, Lord. Say yes. 
a crown on his head he carries a scepter in his hand he's riding a white horse across this land he's calling out to you and me will you ride with me yeah and we say yes Lord yes his love for his bride and he's longing that she be with him right by his side that fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him right by his side and he's calling out to us right now will you ride with We say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, we say yes, Lord. Yes, we'll find.
We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We we'll bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, He loves His friend. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Worthy, worthy. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Worthy, worthy. Worthy, worthy. Jesus. 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 Say that name with me, Jesus. 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 Jesus, 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 Jesus. Just the ladies. Just a man, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Everyone together now, Jesus, Jesus. That's incense to God. You know what that sounds like to God? I want you to hear me now. In the chapel, those of you at home, I want everyone standing. To God, you know, tonight, this is Friday night, all over this nation. As a matter of fact, right now, it's quarter of 10 in New York. It's about quarter of 7, quarter of 8 out west. People are still in the bars out west, and they're, they're really getting pretty drunk right now in New York and all up and down the east coast. And people right now all over this nation are cursing God, they're cursing Jesus, they're cussing up a storm. People around 12 midnight tonight will be going home from bars and discos and dances and they'll have car wrecks and they'll, 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 they'll run over a, a mailbox because they, they, they strapped one on tonight, they got stoned out of their minds and they'll get out of their cars and they'll curse Jesus for running over the mailbox. They'll curse him. They'll be out on the dance floor and they'll stumble and fall to the ground and they'll curse God. That's what he hears all day and all night. What do you think it sounds like in heaven? When a group of people, and I know what's going on in other parts of the world, but all I can speak of right now is what's going on on this campus. In the chapel, the chapel's got over 1,100 people in it over there. And this group right here, what that must sound like, I just got a feeling it cancels out all the other. Yes. Yes. Ladies, that was so beautiful, you singing that. We're just going to do it a couple more times before we pray together. I want you to, ladies, I want you to sing it again. Jesus. Just the ladies. Jesus. Now just the men, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Now if you can 
sing harmony, I want you to sing it. Everyone's going to come together now. Everyone sing it together. Jesus. 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 Tell him you love him before we pray together tonight. Jesus, I love you. I just plain old love you, Jesus. I just love you. No strings attached. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Now, before we're seated tonight, those of you at home, those of you listening by internet, those of you that are driving by and you've picked up the frequency on the radio, I would, I would encourage you, if you're, if you're coming through Baldwin County or Escambia County, and you've picked up this frequency, I would encourage you, if you've got time, just to stay within the frequency. You know, go, go to the mall parking lot or just drive around town, whatever, so you can listen to the whole program because God has allowed you to tune this in for a reason. And I want you to hear it. I want you to hear the message. And I want God to speak to your heart. We're going to ask everyone to pray the prayer that we've been praying since Father's Day. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Now, I know many of us in this room love the Lord. Many others are backslidden. There's also people like the man that came here and just came out of a drunken stupor. He came into the church. People like that come all the time to the revival. Maybe that's you. You're here and you have no clue what's going on. You, maybe you don't even believe in God. Maybe you're like this one young man who said he was in witchcraft for so long. And he said, if you're a witch out there or a warlock, you know, he said something like, you need to get saved tonight. We have witches and warlocks that come to this revival. And if you're here tonight, maybe you came to disturb the meeting. You're here tonight. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Matter of fact, I dare you to pray this prayer. We used to say it, kids. As kids, we used to say, I double dog dare you. Never understood that, but I still, I double dog. What is a double dog? <laughs> it's two dogs. He said, it's two dogs. we got a smart man over there. But I challenge you to pray this prayer. You're just going to pray it sincerely. Say, the Lord, speak to my heart. Change my life. Simple prayer. Everyone pray with me. Whether you love God or not, if you're a God lover or God hater, I want you to pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In your precious name. In, precious in name. Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As the prayer team is coming on, I want to make a couple of announcements. I want everyone that is visiting from Japan to stand up. If you're from Japan, stand up. Okay? Stay standing. Now, this group of people being touched by the power of God in a mighty way. And Japan needs revival, folks. But, uh, <laughs> but I want to say something to you. Something happened today that you need to hear about. Translators, I want you to hear this well. I want everyone to hear this. The church got a call from a, a business in town called The Gap. Many people know of the clothing store, The Gap. And uh, they got a call. The church got a call today uh, from The Gap management. And they said this, there is a group of people visiting your revival from Japan in our store, and we want you to know that this is the most incredible, fantastic, loving, kind group we've ever had come in this store. God bless you for being Christian witnesses in this community. This is a store that called the church. They knew, that this whole this city knows all about the revival. But to, to have seen you folks from other countries treating them so well and so kind, God bless you and thank you. You may be seated.
And also, I'd like to say something for those of you from other countries. Here we have something that we call a tip in restaurants. Let me explain it to you. This is hard for some people to swallow. But here, no matter how bad the food is, <laughs> if someone waited on us and served us a meal, it is customary in the United States to leave the waitress or the waiter. I'm educated because we've got hundreds and hundreds of international visitors. It is a customary to leave the waiter or waitress a tip. Now, a tip is not, God bless you, have a good day. A tip is not some proverb, okay? A tip is money, okay? And we, it is customary to leave 15% all the way up to 20%. 10% is history. I'm also educating the rest of you folks here, okay? 10% is, those are the bygone days, okay? That was back during the Depression. 10% is gone. 15% or 20% is what you leave as a tip. Now, some of you are having a hard time with that because if you sit down and your meal is, and you're with a group and your meal's 50 bucks, 10%'s five bucks, 20% is $10, and that seems like a lot of money. But that is custom here. Just when I travel in other countries, people will tell me it is customary to eat everything on your plate. And I've been in some rough places, friend, and I'll sit down at that plate, and I remember being there just a few days earlier, earlier, that family had a dog. But I have not seen that dog that day. And I, I remember, Jerry will remember this too, we sat down at a meal, and it was the grisliest, toughest, bitter, just horrible meat. And I know what happened. I know what we were eating. But it was customary to eat what was on our plate. And so that is a custom, just like tipping is a custom here, okay? So help us out on that. Don't say you're from visiting the Brownsville Revival and then leave a nickel, okay, or five cents. Just a little education. Also, um, uh, tonight we have um, E.T. Corbin is with us. This is the real E.T. E.T. Corbin right here. Brother, I want you to stand to your feet. This man is, um, you're 87, 87 years old, been preaching the gospel all over this area, all over South Florida, preaches a house of fire, still loves God, preaches, still on fire, just started a new ministry a couple years ago, a mission in Crestview, which is going great, just on fire for God. But uh, E.T. Corbin is on our prayer team, but he is an, he's, he's got a, an exclusive position with the prayer team, most of all, the prayer team moves around. Every one of the prayer team moves around and prays for you. E.T. Corbin stays where he's at, and people come to him. He's got a, he's got a healing ministry. God's using him mightily in healings. And, uh, and if you want prayer tonight for healing, it might be a little crowded around him, but he will pray for you. Won't you pray for him? He'll pray for you. And um, I don't expect him to go tramping all over this church. You can come to him. But... Um, we got E.T. Corbin on our prayer team, and I'm glad he's there. Hallelujah. One last announcement before the word. Tomorrow, Mike is speaking on, is it grieving the Holy Spirit? Matter of fact, come on up, Mike, and give your... Can this, can this man preach and teach and teach and preach and preach and teach? I wonder, I wonder when I get up here and preach night after night after how they endure me. I mean, seriously, having to sit through me night after night, because some of you come and go, you know, they're here night after night after night. And I get to be in some of the sessions of Mike. I've been in sessions of his as we travel. I've listened to him. I've listened to his tapes. This is, he's an awesome preacher of the word. And uh, this is a rare opportunity for you to be here and be in these meetings. And if you're thinking about tomorrow going to the mall or doing something like that, friend, a mall is a mall is a mall, okay? And uh, just go, go to the mall afterwards or whatever. You need to be in this session. What are you teaching? First, let me say I love to hear you preaching every night. I haven't been bored once in over two years, man. I mean that. Hallelujah. What, what else did you ask me to say? <laughs> Sorry, sorry.
<laughs> Dynamic, awesome, words like that. Right. And humble, very humble. Oh, right. Uh, you know, revival is all about God coming down. I want to talk tomorrow about the things that quench the spirit, the things that put out the spirit's fire. So it'll be eye-opening. That'll be 11 o'clock here tomorrow. Thanks for the introduction. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, whew, something's up tonight. Last night, the power came down. Tonight, if it's anything like last night, I got a feeling. I've been reading a book that is not out yet, and, um, And it's entitled, Go and Sin No More. It's by Dr. Michael Brown. It's going to be coming out in what, January, February, March? By March. And um, I want you to make a note that this needs to be a book. There are a couple books next, next year that you need to get. One is going to be by Pastor on Pastoring a Revival. It'll be coming out next year. But this book is going to be coming out in March, Go and Sin No More. And in there he, let, he shares 21 reasons not to sin. It's... it's it's a user-friendly book. You're going to enjoy reading it. It's broken up in sections that you really, it's easy to understand. But pastors, this is going to be a tool. I want to tell you, pastors, you will get dozens of sermons out of this book. As a matter of fact, tonight's message is coming to you from, no. But, um, it's, <laughs> but 21 reasons not to sin. He says, sin does not satisfy. Sin leads to more sin. Sin leads to worse sins. Sin devastates. Sin degrades and humiliates. Sin steals your joy. Sin steals confidence before God. The wages of sin is death. God will punish sinners. That's a good reason not to sin. Forgive me, translators. I'm going fast. Sin hurts the Lord. Sin hurts the sinner. Sin hurts the sinner's family and friends. He goes on and on. 21 reasons not to sin. And also, the last one he says is, your sin could cost you your salvation. And that's a heavy one. So um, you need to keep that in mind. That's going to be coming out next year, around March. And for every two books of mine that you purchase, you get one of Mike's free. <laughs> we haven't worked out those arrangements. <laughs> but I'm sure Mike is in his head right now. The message tonight is, and the Lord spoke to my heart this morning, believe it or not, this, is, um, this title, I believe, is um, directly related to uh, what hundreds and hundreds of people are going through right now and what millions and billions will be going through in the near future. This is entitled, The Emotionally Disturbed. The Emotionally Disturbed. Translators, I want you to work on that one. The Emotionally Disturbed. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. The emotionally disturbed. What do you think of when someone says he's emotionally disturbed? He's nuts. He's a mental case. He's a weirdo. He's a wacko. He's a kook. Translators, you might as well just forget it and just let me ride through this. He's a, he's a crackpot. He's lame brain. He's a screwball. He's a cuckoo clock. He's a lunatic. He's an oddball. He's insane. He's a basket case. He's flipped out. He's gone off the deep end. He's unstable. He's emotionally disturbed. But I've got a problem. I'm going to define this to you, and I'm going to read some scriptures in just a second. But I've got a problem with emotionally disturbed, with our definition of it. Because emotions, how many here are emotional? How many here are alive? If you're alive, you're emotional. Now, how many are emotional? That's better. Emotion is strong feeling. How many have had a strong feeling about something? How many have, have uh, driven by an ice cream stand and had a strong feeling about it? <laughs> That's emotion. My weakness at Baskin Robbins is chocolate chip mint. You ever had that? <laughs> How many vote that way? You just vote chocolate chip. I see that hand at home. That's my favorite. I have strong feelings towards it. That's an emotion. And so an emotion is a strong feeling. It's a mental and bodily reaction 
marked by strong feeling and physiological responses that prepare the body for action. Let me put that in simple English. You're walking by Baskin Robbins. You walk a little bit closer. You see your ice cream there. You see another person licking on it. That's all it takes. Okay? And so your bodily, your emotions cause your body to move towards it. And you'll say, I'll take a double scoop of that right there on a waffle cone. To be disturbed is to destroy the tranquility or the composure of someone, to make someone or something uneasy. It just means to ch change. You can, be, you can be walking along the road, just walking down the road, walking down a sidewalk, and a dog begins barking out, and it could be behind a fence, but suddenly you come emotionally disturbed. And the dog may be behind the fence and he's growling at you, but he can't get to you. How many know what I'm talking about? You can be emotionally disturbed. So I want you to get out of your mind this negative sense of emotionally disturbed because everyone at one point in their life is going to be part of this category, the emotionally disturbed. And I'm going to show you in Scripture, all Jesus did his entire life was emotionally disturb people. Everywhere he went, he created basket cases. Everywhere he went, people went nuts. He could not go anywhere without people getting all bent out of shape, twisted, disturbed to a place where they came out in rage against him. They would begin picking up rocks. A few minutes ago, they were in church worshiping God. The next minute, they were trying to kill this man. Are you listening? I lived in Tallahassee, Florida for several years where the um, Florida State Seminoles reside. And um, you may be here at this revival and you're watching every one of us and you're saying, you know, those guys, at this these guys are nuts. You're watching that baptism, you go, these guys are loco. These guys are crazy. These guys are nuts. But I lived in Tallahassee. And I'm help me on this, I'm trying to figure this out. I lived in Tallahassee. And we would go to a football game every now and then. I really felt that the football games were not a safe place to be. After going to one or two, I realized that's a dangerous place because the fans for the Florida State Seminoles were crazy. And you call us nuts, friend. You're here tonight, and, and we're jumping up and down and clapping. You think we're nuts? You should go to a game like that and watch a businessman who just... Earlier, he's a CEO of a major corporation in Tallahassee, maybe a congressman. That's the state capital. May, now he's at the football game. He was in a nice suit. Now he's at the football game, and he's wearing a short Indian skirt. <laughs> he's got some type of braided vest on. The hairs are hanging out of the ch his chest. He's dressed up just like an Indian. He's got war paint all over his face. He's got a fake mohawk haircut, a wig that he's wearing. He's carrying this big rubber tomahawk, and he's walking into the football stadium. Our congressman, okay? And if you're, you live in Tallahassee, you've ever been to one of those games, Every now and then the fans will stand up and they'll go, Florida State, Florida State, Florida State, Florida State. And then they'll go, oh, 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 oh. And here is a man, college graduate, degrees, intelligent in the eyes of his peers, acting like an insane maniac, jumping all over the place going, oh, 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 oh. The man's emotionally disturbed, friend. <laughs> so don't come to me about your problems with this revival and how people react to God. Who? <laughs> oh. Matthew chapter 10, I want you to hear this. This is disturbing news. Say disturbing news. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. You there? 
But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now, this is not a Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so type of message. This was not fun to hear this kind of stuff. Jesus did not always feed the multitudes. Oftentimes, he was disturbing the multitudes. He was messing with them. He was finding out what they're made of, and in this revival, Jesus is going to find out what you're made of. If you really love him, if you really care about him, if you really want to get saved, then he says this. This is disturbing news. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Whoa. I hope you're listening, friend. Now, Jesus could have had a peaceful congregation up to this point, and now they're going, whoa, 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 whoa. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Come on, Jesus, this is, this is different. How many have seen the fact that Jesus Christ brings division? I have in my own life. I've seen it in my family. I had members of my family that loved me until I got saved. And when I got saved, they wouldn't talk to me. One of them, my brother, my older brother, he wouldn't speak to me for 10 years. He called me a nut. He called me crazy. And he moved. Matter of fact, I never thought about this. He called me a nut. And he moved to California, built a teepee. <laughs> this is my brother George, okay? My brother George built a teepee out in the Sierra Mountains, out in Sonora, California, built a teepee and got a goat and a pig and lived in that teepee with the goat and the pig. And he called me not. And then he starts playing music out in California, winds up working with the Grateful Dead and just does that whole scene out there. He is employed with the Grateful Dead. And so, and he calls me nuts. By the way, my brother has gotten saved and he was baptized right there about six months ago. But I remember, friend, when he first saw the change in me, he rejected it totally. Luke chapter 12, 49 through 53. If you don't want to turn there, just listen. But Luke chapter 12, 49 through 53. This is entitled, The Emotionally Disturbed. I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptized, baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Translators, you can just translate that. It's the saying that the family is going to be divided against themselves. And then as you read on in the Scripture, I began a study today on this, is, and we live pretty exhausted, so you do the best you can with what energy you have. But as I began studying the Scripture, everywhere I followed Jesus, he was messing with people. The very thing that he spoke was happening before their very eyes. In John chapter 7, verse 43, it says, So there was a division among the people because of him. John chapter 9, verse 16, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God because he keeps not the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. You want to know what he was doing? He was emotionally disturbing them. Are you listening to me? Because we're going somewhere with this tonight, friend, but I want to establish this, that Jesus would bring division everywhere he went. He would cause people to look inside. When I say things like this at the Brownsville Revival, listen up in the chapel. When I say something like, you can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. 
you can go to hell and have a certificate of ordination from the Southern Baptist or the Assemblies of God hanging behind your desk. You know what that does to some people? It causes them to become emotionally disturbed. When I say things like this, sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Jesus would never sit in front of a TV set with a remote control in his hand and flip through the channels and stop when he saw someone slipping their clothes off and crawling under the sheets with somebody. Jesus would never do that. And there are people listening tonight, they were fine, Pastor, until I said that. Some of you at home, you're fine until I start meddling with that area of your life. And so you become emotionally disturbed. It hits your emotions, and you say, who on earth did he think he is talking like that? You become disturbed. Your emotions, you rise up in anger. There was a lady that ran out of the church. She was sitting right here as I was preaching the gospel. She got up and fled the church on Saturday night. Couldn't stand it anymore. She was becoming emotionally disturbed. She left, drove home, pulled into her driveway, ran in the house, turned on the TV out as disgust, and there we were. <laughs> she could not believe it. I was screaming at her here and screaming at her there. She was a basket case, friend. She could not believe it. And she knew that God had her the next Sunday morning. The next day, she showed up at this church, and she got saved. And that's how we know the story. John chapter 10, verse 19 says, There was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. Everywhere he went, friend, he caused trouble. I said, everywhere he went, he caused trouble. Now he would say things like this. Some of us miss this red ink in the Bible. But you need to read the red stuff. He talked about the vengeance of God coming. And he said things like, but woe unto you, and this is found in Luke chapter 21, verse 23. Woe unto you that are with child to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all the nations. He talks about Jerusalem being trodden down of the Gentiles. He goes on and on to talk about the, the, the things that are about to come. In Luke chapter 12, verse 26, he says, If ye then be not able to do the thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? This is the wrong scripture. But he goes on and he talks about how there's danger. There's danger ahead, and he emotionally disturbed people. As he was talking about prophetic happenings down the road he would look at people and they would become agitated that is not what they wanted to hear they did not want to hear that these things were about to come to pass as you read revelation chapter 6 this is the one i wanted to read to you and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men listen to this the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond Man, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? When people read that, friend, they become emotionally disturbed. They go, my Lord and my God, that's everybody. Everybody, that scripture is talking about everybody. It's talking about me, that I'm going to run from God. I'm going to try to find the rocks and say, rocks, fall on me. I can't handle this. Hide me from the wrath to come. But here's where we're going tonight with this, friend. By the way, what spurred this message tonight was a letter that we read last night. About two weeks ago, a man came through those doors after dropping off a prostitute across the street, came in from Louisiana, a very husky man, handsome man, had some money in his pocket, but he's a crack addict, drug addict, a man of the streets, a man of the world, and to this day, he doesn't know how he wound up in this church after dropping off a prostitute. That is not what you normally do after dropping off a prostitute. 
You go to a bar or something like that, I'm sure, but you don't come to a church. And so he comes into this church and he sits down next to our medical team here. And all the way through the song service, he's crying. Are you hearing me? He's crying. What's his, by the way, this man is a captain of a boat, a captain of a ship that he, he, he works with the oil rigs out in the Gulf. We're not talking about a wimp. We're talking about the captain of a boat. He's, he's a man, a sturdy, strong, stable man, and he's crying like a baby. He's emotionally disturbed. He's emotionally disturbed. He's sane. Fine. He was fine until he came in this place. But now, he's falling apart. And he cries all the way through the song service. Those of you at home, I want you to listen and don't turn this off because this is what causes people to get saved by allowing the anointing of the Holy Ghost to penetrate their hearts. And you better stay tuned. Because the Holy Ghost wants to penetrate your heart. Don't turn him off. Don't quench the Holy Ghost. So this man, all the way through the song service, he cries. The message begins to be preached. He cries all the way through that. The altar call is given. He runs down here and gets right with God. It's a phenomenal story. It's all true. He wrote this letter, and I'm not going to read the whole letter. But he wrote the letter how he had to leave here and go back to his ship. And because of his change, because of the change, listen to this. Before he was a drunkard, a drug addict, a man's man, running around with women, the ways of the world. Before, that's what the man was. Now he's saved. He quit drugs, quit running around. He's living a clean life. He goes back to his ship. The company demotes him. Because of the change in his life, they demote him to a deckhand. Isn't that wild? And they call him brainwashed. It's all in this letter. Isn't that wild? Don't we live in a twisted world? Man, if I, was, if I had a ship, if I was a company and I had a ship, I would want a Christian man managing that ship. I wouldn't want somebody that's snorting cocaine or smoking crack. I'd want someone's got a, I wouldn't want someone who's got a flask in his back pocket, nipping at the bottle, going, trying to ma maneuver some ship through the rivers. I'd want, a, I'd want a Christian that's going, Jesus, guide this boat. But instead, they demote him to deckhand. And they call him all kinds of names, and he talks about the warfare, but he's standing strong. He's not buckling over. And when he leaves out of there, he's going to come here. He's got about three more weeks left on this ship, and he's going to come here and be a part of this revival, probably go to this school. It's an awesome story, and he even closes it out. It's so dangerous on that boat because of the, the hellish people that live on that boat. He says, I hope I make it back alive, but if I don't, you know where you can find me. But I'm going to share with you a couple points. I want you to hear me. There seems to be prevalent in this society the fallacy. Everyone say fallacy. It's not true. There seems to be prevalent in this society the fallacy that people have everything together. People seem to have everything together. Now, Jesus saw all through that. He walked around. He looked right past the religious garb. Mike, he could look at a man that had stuff dangling all over him, could be dripping in gold, could have tassels, could have robes, and could have all kinds of beautiful braided belts. Oh, whatever he wore to this religious meeting, Jesus saw right through it, and he said, you whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. He would emotionally disturb people. Could you imagine that kind of life and then having someone come up that's being followed by all these people? And he comes up and points at you and says, You're, you are whitewashed tomb full of dead men's bones. Jesus constantly saw what I'm talking about tonight. But when there's a fallacy in the land that people have everything together, I want you to get that. The other day I was driving down the road. I was on my way to the revival. And a man pulled up next to me in a, in a sporty foreign automobile. And I looked at him and he was just oozing with arrogance. 
You ever met people like that? Just, whoa. You know, he looked over at me at my Dodge Caravan, you know, you know, with, with a scrape mark all the way down the side of it for my, I don't know, bicycle scraped up again. You know how it is having kids. There's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun when you got kids. As soon as you buy it, it's old. <laughs> After a while, you just give up. I mean, you just, you do the best you can. But he looked over at me, I looked over at him, and it was just like, how you doing, low life? You know, and he just, he just reeked of that. And I saw him, you know, right now, he seems to have it together. But in a short amount of time, he is going to be one emotionally disturbed individual. Because Jesus spoke things like there will be divers, earth, there will be earthquakes in divers places. There will be this, there will be that, there will be uh, wars and rumors of war. There will be things taking place in the near future, friend. Peter said something like, you know, the whole earth is going to burn. He was just, he laid it on the line. It's all going up in smoke. Everyone within the sound of my voice is going to be emotionally stir disturbed. Before you end up your career called life, it's going to be, you're going to get disturbed. I'm heading somewhere with this friend. The other day we were in Atlanta. My wife and I took a couple days off, and we were driving through a, one of the suburbs of Atlanta, and here come a, a couple punkers. These kids were so cool. Nobody could be wearing more stuff than they had on. It's impossible. You'd have to have wheels. <laughs> they looked like two pack mules. First of all, it was hot as fire. And these guys had leather, chains. I mean, the bell bottoms were dragging the ground, tattoos, rings, stuff. I mean, they were just loaded down. And he had his hand in her hip pocket. She had her hand in his hip pocket. And they were just scuffling down the road. They looked like they had... I mean, I used to look like that so I could talk like this, friend. They looked like they had, drunk, they, they had just, just, just crawled out of some dumpster. But they were as cool as cool could. I mean, they had the world under control. They were just, you know. You know what I'm talking about. And they look over at you, you know, like, oh, don't you wish you could have the life that we have? You know, not a care in the world. It was so Jerry and I laughed. I mean, just to ourselves, it's, it's funny, folks. It's funny. Because it's all a facade. It's all a mask. Everybody appears to have it all together. Maybe tonight you're that way. You might be like the doctor who came in and sat in this section over here. An eye surgeon that came down from central Alabama. He came in to check out the revival. He's a master surgeon in America, the type that fixes corneas when it's crushed in automobile accidents. He can knit the thing back together again. He's a master surgeon. He's sitting here, cool, wealthy. He's got it together. About halfway through the service, he becomes emotionally disturbed. He's going, my God, he's talking about me. <laughs> You can't be talking about me. I've got money. I've got prestige. I've got a business. People call on me from all over the world. You can't be talking about me. But he's sweating. And he's crying. He's emotionally disturbed. Why? Jesus will strip you of all that, friend. He'll get down to the root of your problem. The businessman knows how to look together. He might have his $5,000 Armini suit on, his Rolex watch, his keys to his Jaguar jingling in his pocket. He knows how to confidently smile with a wink and a handshake. In his office are hanging degrees, masters of business administration, PhD in corporate marketing. He's got his act together. The athlete, he walks around. Maybe you're here tonight. You got your Nikes all on your Umbro shorts and your Adidas T-shirt. Always looks fit. You talk about your workout routine. Your muscles are bulging. You, buy a, you wear an extra large, but you just buy a small. You get your brother to help you get the T-shirt on, man. It's just, uh, there, that's better. Walk into Burger King, you oh. Whopper. Large fries.
You're laughing because you've seen them. I've seen them. <laughs> I'm going, something's wrong with this picture. High school students look like they got it all under control. Young people, you know what I'm talking about. They scuffle down the hallway. They got their little lady in their hands, you know, they're walking down. He's got his varsity jacket on. They're, it's cool, cool, cool. They got their little huddle of friends over by the lockers, laughing up, telling jokes. Everything seems cool. I remember I was at a, a meeting. They asked me to come speak at this high school. And it was in the middle of the day. And um, these are, they're freaky to do when you don't have a band. You know, I don't travel around with the newsboys of DC talk, you know, I was just. <laughs> and so they asked me to come speak at this school. And they said, we want, we're having a lot of problems with our juniors and seniors. Could you speak to all of them? And I'm going, you know, yeah, whatever, you know. So they bring them all together in the gymnasium. And it's in the middle of the day. I've got 40 minutes to speak to all these kids, and they don't want to be there. They don't want to be there. And then the preacher and the, the, the principal says, you can't talk about Jesus. So I'm going, i got to speak to all these students, and I can't talk about Jesus. And so I get out there. There's no music. There's no nothing. It's cold turkey. Hello. And if you've ever spoken to high school students, you better have something to say. And so I started talking for a few minutes, and I realized that I was not going to get to where I wanted to get in the time frame that I had, I needed to go for the gold. And I noticed a man, a young man in the middle section snickering. He's just sort of joking, you know, with his friends. Acting cool. Say cool. Cool. Just acting cool. You know, just sort of laughing and making sure his friends laughed, you know. And, and so I walked over to him. I said, well, what's your name? He looked up at me, and if looks could kill, he was ready to kill, but it's too late. 500 of his friends were watching him responding to me. And so he said, James. I said, well, James, ain't you something? <laughs> I, said, I said, you the leader of this pack? I said, are these all your little groupies? I said, James. I said, who's that next to you? I said, what's your name? And he gave me his name, Billy, something like that. And I said, Billy, do you follow James everywhere he goes? And that's what the rest of the student body did. They laughed, and then they went, ooh. And I said, Billy, when James laughs, do you laugh? And I mean, these folks were getting ticked. But I had their attention. I had everybody's attention. And so I went ahead and went for it because God spoke to my heart about the kid. I said, James, let me tell you something about your life, and I want everyone to be, I want everyone to hush, and you could hear a pin drop in that high school. This was just the juniors and seniors. You could hear a pin drop. And I said, James, you're cool here at this school, but you're going through hell at home. You can't stand living. You can't stand getting, as a matter of fact, getting to school is a retreat for you because it's such hell at home. I said, your family's going through hell. You can't stand to wake up in the morning. You don't know what life's going to be like at night when you get home because of the, just a battling at home. And then guess what happens? A tear wells up in the kid's eye, and it drips down his cheek. Boy, it gets heavy. He became emotionally disturbed. And then I heard a girl laughing. And I went, oh, what's your name? <laughs> and she happened to be a real cute girl. And I said, well, you're pretty. I said, do all the guys go after you too? Do they grope on you? Let me ask you something. And I said, what's it like for you in the morning when you get up in the morning? Do you have to get up and spend an hour or two primping in the mirror? Because you know all the guys are going to be gawking at you all day long. Don't you get sick of guys undressing you as you walk around school? just staring at you and undressing you. Don't you get sick of that? Don't you get sick of guys all want to have their, that want to have their paws all over you? And you could hear a pin drop. No ooze, nothing this time. And she dropped her head, and she visibly became emotionally disturbed. Then I got up to the platform. I had about 20 minutes left. And I said, 
well, I'm going to go ahead and go for it. The principal was standing off the side of the platform because, you know, we're notorious, preachers are notorious for violating rules, you know, in school. You know, it's like hit and run. And so I thought, I got 20 minutes and this, I've got the whole school in my hands. I mean, these kids are ready. They're crying, they're broke up, they're, they're with me. So I said this, I cannot tell you how Jesus Christ changed my life because that's against the rules. <laughs> and the principal was standing over there going, And I said, if you want a total change in your life, you're sick and tired of the way things are going, get up from your seat and come down here as quick as you can. Whoop, whoop. I mean, it was just, whoa. And the principal was watching. And so then I, then I, what do you do? You can't give that. I gave an altar call, but you can't do that. But I didn't give, you know, like a Brownsville Jesus altar call because you can't do that. It's against the rules. So I said, now it's obvious every one of you will want to change. I cannot pray with you and ask you to have Jesus Christ transform your life because it is against the rules. And then, and then a little, a girl came up to me and she handed me the note, and I still got this note. She handed me this note. She said, you can't, but we can. Yes, Lord! Yes, Lord! Yep. And they commenced to praying. That was one of the strangest meetings I've ever been in, but it's just like, to this day, I still wonder what happened. Because, you know, you just never could nail anything down. But they started praying with these kids. Kids were crying, weeping, and wailing. They look like they have it under control. Tonight you might be here with me. You might be a religious person. You've got your brand new teak leather Bible. Or maybe it's mauve color. Or maybe you've got one for every outfit. <laughs> it's got gold-edged pages, thumb tabs, and your name and printed on the front. You smile in church. You know exactly how to say the right things. During prayer, you bow your head exactly the way you're supposed to. And during the hymn, you sing it with your head cocked at the consecrated angle. You got it all together. We appear this way, friend, but see, Jesus walked through this muck. He walked through it, and he didn't put up with it. He saw it. And that's my next point tonight, friend. I'm going to move fast, and we're going to close. Jesus spent his life messing with people's togetherness. He spent his life messing with people's emotions. Friend, this morning in my study, I had a blast reviewing the Gospels with the sole intent of discovering all the times Jesus messed with people. People who appeared to have everything together became emotionally disturbed when the man from Galilee came into town. From his birth to his death to his resurrection, all the way until now, Jesus is messing with people's heads. Even when he died, the crucifixion, when he hung his head and died, and the earth began to shake, darkness filled the earth, people began to beat their breasts. You read it in Luke chapter 23, the Bible says that they beat everyone. Everyone that was at the crucifixion began beating their breast like this, and that was a sign of contrition, of brokenness, of guiltiness. They were all going, my God, what have we done? They all became emotionally disturbed. That's all Jesus does. Messes with you. Whew. Man, I, I felt that. And then he transfers this to his disciples. And they spend their lives messing with people. You with me? You know the scripture? In Acts 17, the Bible says in verse 6, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. 
You know what they were doing? Messing with everybody. Here they come. Here come the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry students. Did you know? Did you know? Right now, right now, there are 100, not from the Revival School of Ministry, there are 100 teenagers from the youth group at a football game. They have 1,000 tracks. Okay, those of you that wonder what revival is all about, they're over there. You know, we're here worshiping God, listening to the message. They're over there, nitty-gritty, hardcore evangelism, messing with people. I love it, friend. Ruining their day. They came to the ball game to get, to get drunk, sloppy drunk, and they're going to get righteously saved instead. And every Friday night, there's a large group from the Revival School of Ministry, 150 last Friday night, I don't know how many tonight, they go out on the streets preaching the gospel, turning the world upside down, friend, emotionally disturbing everyone they come in contact with. And if you do an evangelism, and if you get a response from people and they cuss you out, you need to rejoice. That was your goal. I mean, until you've emotionally disturbed them. I mean, they picked up rocks to get Jesus. If they haven't picked up rocks yet, friend, you haven't gone all the way. <laughs> as long as now they're cussing at you, they hate you, you're going, yes, this is one. Come on, come on, come on. You blankety blank, 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 blank. I don't believe all that blankety blank, blank. Oh, yeah, that's food, man. That's food for my soul. I like that. I like that. Talk to me. Why? You're doing just what Jesus did. That's all that Jesus did from the time he was born to the time he died. And now, 2,000 years later, still messing with people. Messing with them by the thousands, by the millions, all over the world. He's still messing with them. Ho. Hmm. Hmm. I came to bring division. I came to bring a sword, fire. Think about it, friend. How'd you like Jesus walk up to you and you know, lay his hands on you? Father, I bring division <laughs> to this man's household. Tear it up. Father, just tear it up. That's what he was doing. That's what he did in my house. I don't know what he did in your house, but my house was a mess after I got saved. It was peaceful before we were all blatant sinners. But now somebody had to get saved, and it was a mess. And so it's like Jesus laid his hands on my head and went, oh, tear it up, Father. Put his brother against him. Ten years or so, you know, just sort of mess it all up. Have his older sister cuss him out. That's what she did. I got saved, and we used to party together. I used to go to her house and drink. Then I got saved. She could handle my cussing. She could handle my drinking. But then I started saying, hi, Marcia. Praise the Lord. <laughs> hi, Marcia. Bless God. Glory to God. And she came up to me one day. She cussed me out. She said, don't you ever use that language around this house. <laughs> <laughs> she could handle all the four-letter cursed, dirty, garbage words. But don't you say praise the Lord around me. You understand? By the way, she comes all the time to the revival now. She's on fire. She testified right here how before she came to this revival, she didn't know God. My, my older sister is on fire for God now. It's awesome. But I want to tell you, division came before the peace came. First, there was a division, and I held my ground. Friend, you hold your ground. I said, hold your ground. Don't you back up for nobody. Well, I'm going to close with a couple things. Third point is there's coming a day of disorder that will cause every man, woman, and child to become emotionally disturbed. There is coming a day of disorder that will cause every man, woman, and child to become emotionally disturbed. Friend, there's coming a time in the not-too-distant future that all, everyone, say everyone, everyone, will have their security stripped from them, their mask will fall out, their true identity will be revealed. All things will be revealed. The emotionally together Wall Street 
businessman will become a basket case overnight. When the Lord starts turning on the heat, when he starts turning it up, friend, you're going to see it happen in America. Jesus warned of it. He said they're going to flee, they're going to run, they're going to cry out. What do you think people were thinking when he said, two are going to be in one bed, one's going to leave, the other one's going to stay. Two are going to be out in the field, one's going to shoot up, the other one's going to stay. That disturb people. Are you the one? There's only two of us. There's coming a day of mass disorder where everyone is going to become emotionally disturbed. And my last point tonight is this. It would be a wise thing to become emotionally disturbed now while there's still hope than to wait and lose it down the road when all hope is gone. I would rather go bananas right now. I would rather be like the jailer right now with Paul and Silas. Where the earth quaked, he freaks out. It's an incredibly emotion. The man was emotionally disturbed. Where's that found, Mike? What? The Silas and Paul and Silas? Thank you. Carry Acts 16. I love these guys. Just built in concordance. Just. <laughs> Pastor, everyone needs a Mike Brown and a Kerry Robertson. And a John Kilpatrick. This guy, he just... He just sits back. He, he doesn't speak up. He allows them to just answer the questions. He's, he's going, come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. Come on. Come on. You know where it's at. But that man was emotionally disturbed. And he got saved in that condition. And his, he, he turned around totally. He cleaned up the prisoners. I mean, it was an awesome conversion. I would rather become emotionally disturbed now and get right with God than down the road to become emotionally disturbed and it be too late. Are you hearing me? See, this man right here, this man's conversion, this captain of this ship, this is awesome. Crying, squalling like a baby, being prayed for, hitting the ground under the power of God in this place, God coming all over him. That was an emotionally disturbing time. Thank God it happened. Now, he says, oh, by the way, if I get killed, you'll know where to find me. I'm going to be in heaven. See, he doesn't have to worry about down the road. He doesn't have to worry about Y2K. He doesn't have to worry about a financial collapse. He doesn't have to worry about being emotionally disturbed down the road. He's fine, thank you. Everything's fine now. He's right with God. And there's many people within the sound of my voice, you are not right with God. I'd rather become emotionally disturbed now and get saved than become disturbed emotionally later and be damned. I'd rather be convicted now and weep and mourn over my sins than wait too late and weep and gnash my teeth in the flames of hell. I'd rather feel the fire of the Holy Ghost now than feel the flames of hell later. I'd rather be called crazy now and wind up in heaven than be called a fool later and burn in hell. I'd rather go bananas for Jesus here on earth. We got some Chiquita bananas over there. I'd rather go bananas for Jesus here on earth and be ushered into heaven than be cool as a cucumber here on earth and be cast into hell. They can call me a nut, but at least I'm screwed on to the right bolt. I'm, I'm a fool for Jesus. Whose fool are you? Yeah, 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 I've been brainwashed. My mind was full of filth, the filth of this world, and I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb and cleansed by His Word. I have become emotionally disturbed, and through that I got saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus! Jesus! Help! 
Everybody stand to your feet. Listen up, friend. You better get emotional now. You better allow your emotions. Matter of fact, I want, I want you to hear that again. Just that definition, because some of you still are a little hard-headed. It's a strong feeling, a mental and bodily reaction marked by a strong feeling and physiological responses that prepare the body for action. You know what that means? That means you're standing up right now and you're going, I don't know the Lord. This is emotional. You're not thinking about quarter pounders. You're not thinking about Dallas Cowboys. You're not thinking about fishing. You're thinking about your relationship with God. And you're going. And you're about to do something physiological. You're about to go. When that altar call is given, I'm getting down there. Why? Because this is your emotions. And your emotions are causing a change. Your body's going to do something. Yeah, you've been disturbed. Your tranquility has been destroyed. Your composure has been destroyed, messed with. That's good. That's good. The mask has come off. That's good. That's what Jesus does. The sword of the Lord pierces. The word of God pierces, goes into the heart of man. Can turn over every stone, reveal every secret of every man's heart. He's here tonight, friend. He's in this place. He's in the chapel. I want everyone standing in the chapel. God knows what you've done. I don't know who this is for. God knows what you've done, sir. He knows all about it. I preached a message one night. I think it was called The Secrets of Men. I'm not sure what the title was, but it was right after Princess Di died and I came in here with a camera and everyone was talking about the paparazzi how they had been taking pictures they caused this thing and it was just big big news and I came in with a camera in a flash just walked around with the camera taking pictures <laughs> taking pictures and that's heaven Heaven is always, God is, he's got millions of pictures of you. The Bible says your deeds, your works, your words, you'll be judged for all the words that come out of your mouth. Every idle word will be judged, the Bible says. Your deeds, so he's got all these pictures. Millions of pictures of your life. And I want to tell you, friend, a picture will work in court. God's got all these pictures. He's got a room full of film. And at the end of the message that night, I took the film out of the camera and I did all the pictures in the dark because I was telling folks that in the dark, God sees where you're at. He knows what you're doing. And then we turned the lights on. And I said, here's the thing about the blood of Jesus that's so awesome. Jesus walks into God's dark room and he says, I'll take that. The father says, what? that roll of film. Or maybe the devil's got the roll of film. Hmm? The devil says, no, this is Bob Maxwell. He's been living in sin all his life. Oh yeah, it's true, and that film proves it. But tonight at the Brownsville Revival, he asked me to wash his sins away. Give me the film. So he takes the film. He takes the film. And Jesus is the light. He takes the film and he just pulls it all out of the roll. Just pulls it all out. It's all exposed. It's gone. The image is gone. What happened to all the pictures? No pictures. But, 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 but. No buts. You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You've been cleansed. You've been washed. It's awesome, friend. And tonight, so tonight, if you've been emotionally disturbed, 
If God has brought division in your life, if he has disturbed you tonight, that's what Jesus said he was going to do. And he's brought this, this unsettling in your life. Maybe the temperature has risen tonight and you're boiling. You've got to get right with God. This is what we're going to do. I don't want anyone to move yet. And in just a minute, Charity's going to sing a song called Mercy Seat. Everyone who has sin in their life, you're going to come and you're going to get it out. Whatever it might be, you might be sitting there just visiting back and forth. Remember the man that testified tonight? He said, somebody told, what told the preacher that I was there. You know, he said something like that. He said, he said it was like he's preaching straight to me. You all remember that in the baptismal pool? Maybe that's you, and you think somebody came up to me and told me that you were here. No, no one's told me. God knows you. He loves you, and he wants to get the sin out of your life. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Backslider, tonight you can be a little disturbed. You know there's stuff there. Be honest. Would you be honest between you and God? That's one of the things Jesus is a master at, is it's just blowing away that cloak of dishonesty. With one breath of the Holy Ghost, it's gone, and you're standing before God naked. And you can look in front of other people, spiritual, but God knows about the pornography problem. God knows about the anger problem. God knows about the drinking problem, the drug problem. He knows about it, and he reveals it to you. And then you start doing this. You are becoming emotionally disturbed. Friend, it would be wise to settle this issue right now than down the road be standing before Almighty God without the blood, without the cross, without Jesus as your lawyer standing before God Almighty. You think this is emotional. Hell. is unimaginable. Don't experience it. I want everyone with the chairs to move them to the left and the right as quickly as you can. I want to thank everyone tonight as they're moving their chairs. I want to thank you for your offering. I don't know what it is yet. We're still counting it. But I want to thank you in advance for giving to the work of the Lord. I want everyone to look this way as they're moving the chairs. We have been, uh, we're, we're members, our ministry is members of ECFA, the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, set up by Billy Graham. And if you know anything about that organization, they are intense. Intense. That's why a lot of ministries are not part of that organization because they are very strict. And so you can't be a part of ECFA and be a loose spender, be unaccountable. You have got to have your I's dotted and your T's crossed. We are members of ECFA. And also, I want you to hear me, because some of you are looking for a ministry that you can sow into. 2020 came out to our property. How many have heard of 2020? They came out to our property to film a program. We've invited everybody out there. Why? There's nothing to hide. It's just some, we have houses sitting on some acreage, just country homes. And you walk into these country homes, and that's where our offices are at. One home is our distribution center, and we'll have like 15, 20 people answering telephones all day long. We have eight lines that are just busy all day long, just nonstop ringing. And so we do the best we can, but we don't have a palace. There's no chandeliers. There's no gold-plated faucets. And, you know, 2020 came in, and they looked around. And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, you know, nothing. It's just, it's just a simple, simple place. And that's the world, okay? And, the, you know, programs like that can really rip you to shreds. And they do it all the time to ministries. But that's why they ran such good programs. 2020 did major coverage on the revival. That's why they did it, because, hey, what they see is truth, honesty. So I want to thank you for giving. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And we have integrity behind us. I've been a minister of integrity for the last 23 years, and that's not going to change regardless of what happens to Steve Hill in the future. But I just want to thank you so much for giving. And I say that because no matter where we go, 
We've been invited to do meetings of 100, 200, and 300,000 people down the road. And we turn these things down all the time to remain here at the Brownsville Revival. I'm committed to this revival. But it doesn't matter to us if we are speaking to hundreds of thousands. The area of integrity is more important than anything in the world. Trust before God and man. So I just want to say that to you. Here's what we're going to do with this altar call. Charity, I want you to come and join me. She's going to sing a song called Mercy Seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. If you're in this place and you have become emotionally disturbed through the message, you're doing things that Jesus would never do, and you know it, and your heart's doing this, and you know you need to get down to this altar, in just a few minutes, she's going to sing Mercy Seat. I want you to come. You're going to come quickly. In the chapel, at home, up in the balcony, you're going to come quickly. You're not going to hesitate. Why? This is the time to do it. Not later. Not tomorrow. Not tonight at the hotel. This is the time to do it. Right now, while you are feeling what God is doing in your heart, this is the time to move. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him by resisting Him. Others of you in this place have never known the Lord. You're in this place and you feel the presence of God. He's here. He is. It's true. He's here. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to just make the statement, he's here, I can feel him? Or are you going to come down in just a minute and get right with God? You need to show, let your emotions move you right now. Emotions are not a bad thing. People, people say, well, that person's emotional. Everybody's emotional. Jesus at Calvary was emotional. And emotions have moved millions of people to the altar. There's nothing wrong with emotion. You need to feel God moving on your life. And those of you that are religious here, but you don't know Jesus, I don't want you to lie to this preacher, and I don't want you to lie to God. If you don't know him, that means you're not intimate with him. You don't know him. My wife is here tonight. My family comes to the revival. I've been married 19 years, going to be 20 years in April. We love each other. We're intimate with each other. We go out on dates every Monday, never miss it. We, we love each other. We've got three children. We leave the children with the babysitter. We go out on dates. See, my wife hears this stuff as I'm saying it. She's not sitting there going, well, that liar. I haven't been out on a date with him in 19 years. She's sitting here going, yeah, it's all true. We're intimate. We love one another. Some people say they're that way with Jesus. To man, they'll go up to a preacher and say, Pastor, my prayer life is awesome. They'll say to a preacher, man, I tell you, I have never felt so pure and clean in all my life. And then they'll go home and watch pornography. They're steeped in pornography. It's typical. I read today the definition of a Christian, and I was shocked to find this in the brand new Webster's Dictionary because a lot of it's been washed out. Listen to this. This is a Christian, a person who believes or professes belief in Jesus Christ and lives according to his teaching. Well, give them a few years, they'll abridge that part of it, but right now it's in there. And so you call yourself a Christian. Well, are you living holy? That was his teaching. Are you living pure? That was his teaching. Are you a giver? That was his teaching. Do you love? That was his teaching. And if that's not you, if you're not, as a Christian, you're supposed to be anticipating his appearing. You're the bride, he's the groom. You're supposed to listen up in the chapel. You're supposed to be infatuated with him. That means when someone says, Jesus is coming, you go, ah, when? Do you know anything? No, I don't know when. Nobody knows. But he's coming soon. Oh, man, I wish you'd come. Others, they say they want him to come back, but they have this long list of things they want to do before he comes. They just as soon him delay his coming. Friend, that doesn't sound like a bridegroom relationship. Brides and grooms, pastors, you know what I'm talking about. They keep, wanna, keep, they keep wanting to move the date closer. You ever notice that? You know, we're going to get married in two years. You get a phone call the next day. We're going to get married in a year and a half. Twelve months. Pastor, can you come over to the house right now? You know. That's the way people are supposed to be with Jesus. 
I want you to come now, Jesus. I want to be with you now. If you're not like that, friend, I question your relationship with Jesus. I question whether or not you know him. I question it. You need to examine yourself. Are you infatuated? Are you white hot? Here's what we're going to do. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone who's away from God, you're going to come quickly. Pride is the only thing that will keep you back. Pride will say, I don't need to go down there. If I go down there, people are going to see me. Folks, listen and listen carefully. People did not come here to watch you. I hate to pop your bubble, but thousands of people didn't come to watch you. They could basically care less if you come down here. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor, a head of a denomination. We've had actors. We've had all kinds of folks come here, congressmen, senators, governors, governor's families. They come here. We don't walk around going, ooh, look at that, look at that. No, I remember one night a congressman came running down to the altar and got right with God. Wonderful, wonderful, you know, great. But all these people over here weren't going. He just came down. I knew who he was, and I saw him down, and it was awesome. But if people don't come here to watch you, friend. They come here to talk to God. So you're on, you're on your own tonight. If you need to get something washed out of your life, you're going to come quickly. You're going to come quickly. Don't any, let anything stop you. Don't let pride hold you back. If you think you're going to go do this at home, right now you're disturbed, but you think you're going to go do this at home and get right with God at home, I want you to keep in mind that the Christ that I've been preaching about tonight, the one who disturbed people, remember he went all the way to Pilate's hall, and he opened not his mouth when they started the punishment on him that no man can endure. There's not a man in this room that wouldn't have belt out curse words, screamed out in pain. Jesus endured beatings, whippings. They plowed his back with a whip and raked it with pieces of bone and glass. At least 39 times they ripped his back to shreds. He was a mangled mess after that. They put a robe on him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They blindfolded him. They slapped him and said, who did this to you? And he knew. Jesus knew. He could have named the person and where they lived. He was Jesus. He's the one that found Nathaniel under the fig tree. He knows. He could have named the person. He didn't open his mouth. He could have said, David, that's you, and I know where you live. You live at Elm Street. You have a wife and two kids. And David would have freaked out, took his hand off of Jesus' face and probably fallen on his face. But no, Jesus didn't open his mouth. They laid him on a, they, 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 they gave him a beam he carried up to Calvary. They laid him on it, nailed his hands, nailed his feet, stripped his clothes off, and hung him on top of the hill. And then they screamed at him, if you be the son of God, come off the cross. Even the thieves heckled him. Think about it, friend. He went all the way to Calvary for you. And then on top of the cross, on the cross, he goes, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He did all that for you, friend, so you might have forgiveness of sin. And you can't walk 20 feet. You can't come down from the balcony and get forgiveness. What a sham. That's disgusting. If you can't walk 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet in the chapel, walk down the aisle and get right with God when he did all that for you. So don't let anything hold you back tonight. And I'm going to tell you, you might be emotionally disturbed right now, but when you leave this altar, you're going to have the peace of God that passes all understanding. You're going to have the same peace that our captain has. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone in this room, I want you to hear me. If you're away from God, if there's sin in your life, if you're doing things that Jesus would never do, if you've never known the Lord, if you're religious, but you're not on fire for Jesus, you're lukewarm, he said he will spew you from his mouth. If you need forgiveness tonight, I want you to come right now and do not hesitate. Hurry right now in the balcony, in the balcony. Hurry right now in this main auditorium, in the chapel. Come and kneel at this altar. Come and kneel at the altar. Hurry. Come and kneel at this altar. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I face the power. Come on. Hurry. I've seen all my Hurry. own. Hurry. I did not know. Hurry. Hurry. Friend, what are you thinking about? You thinking about doing it later? 
You thinking about down the road you're going to get right with God? There's no down the road. Let me tell you something, friend. There's coming a moment in your life you will become emotionally disturbed. When the havoc that is in the Bible falls on planet Earth, you will wish you had hit the altar earlier. Right now is your opportunity of a lifetime. Get on your knees and say, Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me right now. Come on, come on. Hurry, 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 hurry. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. In the chapel, let's go. In the chapel, let's go. In the chapel, let's go. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Cut the music. Everyone at the, everyone at the altar, keep your heads bowed. Keep your heads bowed. This is not a concert, friend. If you're coming, you're going to come now. This is serious business tonight with God. He sees you. He sees your heart. He knows what you're going through. Don't play games with God. Everyone at the altar at the chapel, keep your heads bowed. Everyone here, keep your heads bowed. Those of you at home, get up from that lazy boy. Get off of that couch. Get out of that bed and go kneel by that TV set. Kneel right there. If you're in your car, kneel right there. Get out of your car. That won't be that bad. Kneel in the parking lot. Ask Jesus to wash you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to make you new. Lindell, I want you to sing this one time through. If you're coming, friend, you've got 30 seconds. I'm closing this altar call. If you're coming, come right now. Hurry, hurry. 29, 28, 27, 26. Come on, hurry. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. turn to the person next to them and ask them if they need Jesus Christ to forgive them. Ask them that question. And if they say yes, bring them down here with you and do not lie. Bring them down here with you. Come on, let's sing it again. Come on, everybody, let's go. Lord, yes, Lord. Have Lord, have mercy. Come on. Come on, God bless you. 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 Everyone at the altar, bow your heads. I would hope by now you've asked the Lord to wash you and cleanse you, but now we're going to do it corporately. And as we do it corporately, you're going to be still doing it individually. This is personal between you and God, but we're going to corporately unite our voices together in the chapel, at home, and in this main auditorium. We're going to ask the Lord to wash us and to cleanse us and to make us new. Sure, your emotions have gotten a hold of you right now and they're disturbed in your spirit, but I want to tell you, friend, this agitation is going to bring peace. This agitation is going to bring peace. It's going to cause the Spirit of the Lord to come on you in a way that is going to baffle your imagination. It's called the peace that passes all understanding. Everyone at this altar, pray with me right now. Dear Jesus. No, pray. Everyone at the altar, lift up your voice. Pray out loud. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Lord Jesus, I have been disturbed. You have spoken to me. I have listened to you. 
and I am responding. I ask you tonight to wash me. I have sinned. I have hurt you. I have hurt others. And I've hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me, Jesus. Cleanse me, Jesus. Make me new. I ask you tonight to be my Savior. Be my Lord and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours and you are mine. Jesus, come live your life through me. I give myself to you. In your precious name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord.